to see how the disciples responded to what Jesus had asked them to do, to see how others responded to what the disciples taught, and to understand what might enable others to respond to us. So we're going to take a look, if you'll turn in your packet to what I, we call the Mark chart. This is the Mark chart, and this is kind of a summary of the book of Mark. Now where we are, you know, I'm going to try to use this. Look at there, it works. Um, where we are right now on the Mark chart is this first part right here. This is the 17 miracles that we, uh, that we reviewed that Jesus was involved in in this gospel of Jesus' deeds. And that brought us to the point uh, that Jesus would ask the question, who do men say that I am? So when we're talking to other people, it's my feeling that the first thing we should do is talk to people about Jesus, his miracles, his compassion, and things. And you might say, well, wait a minute. These people already believe in the Son of God. Well, that doesn't mean that they know that much about what Jesus did. They just may have that belief. And they also, before I think you can go on with it, need to know how you feel about the Son of God and what he's done. Because this is where I believe that discipleship and sharing God's gift should start. And you say, well, they believe in the Son of God. I don't need to ask this question, who do men say that I am? Well, you can ask the question something like, well, after, how do you feel about Jesus after we've talked about these things? You know, how do you feel? And that just helps get a discussion going in the right direction, in my opinion. And that is talking about Jesus and who he is and why we're in love with him and why he loves us. So the book of Mark kind of rounds that out. So we start out with these, these right here, the 17 miracles that Jesus uh, performed. And quickly, I think that we need to look and show them. If you look at this little uh, uh, circle here, I didn't put all the scriptures down, but I did put down John 20, 30 and 31. What was the purpose of the miracles? The purpose of the miracles was that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So that's why Jesus went about doing these things. Now, and there were many other signs in the presence of his disciples that aren't recorded, but all of these miracles are made so that we would come to the conclusion that Jesus is uh, the Son of God. Now, also, after this chart, on this chart, after we finish here, the question, and, and Peter uh, pronounces that he believes that Jesus is the Son of God, then we have to, Jesus is going to immediately teach them that he's going to suffer and die. And that's something we can review out of the book of Mark. Right after that, if you look down here, you see there's suffering statements. Jesus is going to, and, and then later in Mark, he's going to do three more miracles. But we got the purpose, and then over here, Jesus is going to teach them about his suffering and why he's going to suffer. And if you look up here uh, in Mark 8, 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and then it must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, I said Peter gets it, but Peter doesn't totally get it, does he? Okay, Peter has come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. But right off the bat, when Jesus begins to tell Peter that he's going to suffer and be killed, Peter does what? He takes him aside and he begins to rebuke him. And Jesus says, looks at his disciples, he rebukes Peter, get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Peter doesn't totally get it. But that happens a lot of times with people. Once we bring them to the realize and teach them, and I, I really think it's important whether they believe in Jesus or not to cover the part that shows them how we believe and how we feel in Jesus. 
And let's, let's, don't get the cart before the horse. Let's start with Mark and, and tell them that, how we believe in Jesus. And then part of that is leading them to the point to where Peter is and say, okay, now that we know that he's the son of God, let's go ahead and see what he's done for us. Let's see what he's done for us. Just like Peter. Peter didn't understand. So we're going to show what he's done for us. And Jesus is taught that he would suffer and die for mankind. Um, they're on their way to Jerusalem in Mark 10 with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed him were afraid. He took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. And if you look down in Mark 10, 33, uh, the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the Pharisees. They will condemn him to death and he will hand him, they will hand him over uh, to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will arise. So I think that before we start talking about uh, the Great Commission, that people need to understand that Jesus knew that he was going to suffer and die for us. And that was part of the plan. And Peter would understand that by the time we get around to, uh, to the Great Commission. There are other suffering statements as you see, uh, see over here on what we call uh, the Mark chart. And Jesus would uh, teach in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom uh, for many. So here's the question. Why would God allow this to happen? When we're talking to people and we show them the compassion and love of Jesus, now they have to know that Jesus is going to suffer and he's going to die. And the question might become, well, why would God allow this to happen? And then I think you can quote to them a very familiar verse. It's because God loved you. He loved you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him, shall, uh, and most versions say should, I copied down the one out of the NIV, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So those that believe in him should not perish if they do what's right and do what God requires of them and wants them to do. 1 John 2 and uh, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I think it's important after we talk to somebody about the Lord to make them realize that Jesus is going to suffer, that he's going to die. And in Mark 15, 38, when that happens, he's going to say, surely this man was the son of God. And because of the death of his son, access to the father is available to us. And uh, God allowed it to happen because he loved you and I so much that he became the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins for the whole world. Now, before going to the father, after Jesus has been raised from the dead. If you want to look at Mark 16, 15, and this is what Jesus tells his apostles. You think about it now. He's done all the miracles. He has suffered. He has died. He has given his life. And now he's going to tell the apostles what that means for them. And what that means, he says in Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So we know that he's commanded them, or he's already told them that whoever believes and is baptized uh, will be saved. 
But I want you to also not, we don't want to stop there. What we want to do is reiterate that Jesus has now told them what he wants them to do, right? He's told those apostles, he said, this is what I want you to do. Now, the words of Jesus will lead his apostles to do that, and it also lead us to do that. Okay, so let's take a look and see what they did. And if you want to get out your Bibles again, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And if you want to, to look at um, the little conversion chart that I have in your pamphlet, uh, feel free to do that. See, Jesus has told them the book of Acts is a historical document and it, char it basically charts the growth of the church in the first century. It tells of the activities of Peter, Paul, and the, uh, and the other apostles. It's not just a historical reference, but it's a personal journey telling us the personal conversions of many people. The book of Acts tells us how the apostle obeyed what they were commanded to do in the Great Commission. And that's why we're going to look at the book of Acts. Now, there's, these points are important, so I'm going to go over them as we begin to study the book of Acts. And I hope you see what we're talking about. This is a very simple way to, to teach the gospel. But these are things we have to realize and they don't necessarily have to realize. But it might, ask, it might help you to answer a question that that person might have. We know that Jesus told his disciples to go into the world. The book of Acts is a record of the disciples doing just what the Lord had told them. The examples of those coming to the Lord are examples that we should use to bring people to the Lord. We can see what they did, and then we can show people what they should do in the same way. By looking at the examples, we can see what people did. In each conversion, number five, there is recorded elements of what those people were told to do. This is important, number six. If we look at the elements in each conversion, we can come to the conclusion as what to what was required of all of them. So in verse in number seven, each element is not mentioned in every conversion. We can be feel assured that every element was present in every conversion. What, what I'm saying there is we're gonna, we see some conversions where all these things weren't done, but that didn't mean they didn't do them. They're just mentioned in these different conversions. So what we will do is those obeying the gospel today should obey all the elements in their conversion just as those who obeyed the gospel in the first century. So when we put it all together, it becomes very easy and very evident to know what all of these people did to be saved. Does that make sense? Now, if, if, if we say believe and you'll be saved, well, they're, if they're telling somebody else to do something different in another place, then we know that that wasn't the only thing, that it included these other things. Because the Lord wouldn't say, you do this here, and, and now this group over here, you don't have to do that. He would put it all together. And that's what we're going to find in the book of Acts. So let's turn to... Uh, let's turn to uh, Acts 2. And all of you are familiar with this, but we're going to just... Uh, quickly look at these, uh, at these conversions. Um, in verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11. Oh, would somebody go turn these lights on for me? <laughs> would you turn these lights on, Jesus? I'm having a little trouble seeing, this, uh, seeing my Bible here. Whatever. Um, in Acts 2, verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11. Raised, thank you. Raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you Listen carefully what I have to say. Listen carefully. So if you look up here and you see what's in red, you see he's addressing his listeners. So they're doing what? They're hearing. 
their hearing. Okay. Then look at verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. They're hearing. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So boy, he, he, he's laying it right out there, isn't he? Guess what, guys? You killed him. You killed him. You crucified him. He was God. He raised him from the dead. Now, look over in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should, shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for whom the Lord our God will call in verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I think there are probably times, this is absolutely the best example of conversion that we have. And it, it, I think at this point, I would spend time with that talking to someone, you know, and then you can go on. We're going to go on to the other examples of conversion, for we have a reason. But this right here is probably all a person uh, needs to know about being baptized. I mean, here it is. What does he say? Look, look what I put in the red here. They've heard. Uh, there is repentance here. There's baptism. And what's the purpose? For the forgiveness of sins. And boy, that's really important. It's not unto the forgiveness of sins, as some people try to uh, describe it. It's for the forgiveness of sins. And we will see that again in Paul's conversion. And then I went ahead and, and put this in here. They are added to the church added to the church and we all know what that means we're not we're not going to join it we're going to be added to the church by the Lord so what elements do we have in this conversion we have people that heard we have people the repenting being baptized and it's for the remission or for um, the forgiveness of sins let's turn to Acts the eighth chapter <clears throat> I think that's the, the next one, I, yeah. Acts 8. And we're going to talk about Philip going down into uh, the persecution, Philip in Samaria. If you want to look at the first verse there, it says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, in verse 4, among those that had been scattered, said those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Now, look on down there in verse 11. We get a story about Simon the sorcerer, and you probably remember what happened to him. He tried to buy... Uh, by that sorcery with money. But the main thing, the conclusion of Philip going down into Samaria is found in verse 11. It said, They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, they, they followed Simon's, what they're saying. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. 
Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So, Philip going down into Samaria, what do we see? The crowds heard, they believed, and they were baptized, both men and women. Going back to reiterate, Jesus told them to go into the world and teach the gospel. What are we seeing here? It's exactly what they're doing. This is what they're doing. And these are examples of what they're doing. Uh, also, let's look in verse in chapter 8 here. Uh, turn over to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch here. This is uh, one of the things that Gordon talked to Bill about when we were there on that Sunday the Ethiopian eunuch and this example. And I, I, the way Gordon did it, it made a huge difference to Bill. And I think his understanding of what uh, God is asking him to do. But in, in chapter 8, in beginning about verse, uh, oh, let's, go, let's go over to verse 30. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? And Philip asked, and how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Peter to come and sit with him. So we're going to find right off the bat, uh, Philip, with, he tells him, so we're going to, this man's going to hear, right? He's going to explain so that he'll know. So he will hear. And the eunuch um, asked Philip in verse 34, tell me please who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else and Philip begins with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So at that point they're traveling along the road they come to some water and the eunuch said look here is water what can stand in the way of my being baptized. Now when he asked that question what is obvious at that point he believes he believes and so here's uh, you know, in the NIV, and I, I, I'm really not happy about this, but the, the NIV uh, puts down below in small letters verse 37. But I think you'll find in the other translations of the Bible that verse 37 is, is in there. Uh, he says, Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what are we finding in this passage? We're going to find uh, the Ethiopian unit. He's going to be told, so he hears. And he says, here is water. Why should not back? He confesses what? He confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. We find that in his conversion. And then uh, he, he goes into the water uh, and he is immersed in the water. Now, why is it significant that he goes into the water to be immersed? Because it represents what's taught in Romans 6, where the Bible teaches that we are immersed, and Gordon had this little, little thing that showed Bill, we, we die to the world by going under the water and were raised to walk in newness of life. Now, like I told you, this is a simple story, and we're just going to show people what the conversions in the New Testament was. Uh, there may be times when you need to go into that a little deeper, but the Bible teaches clearly that the Ethiopian eunuch went into the water and he was immersed. So I think that we should take that into consideration. Let's look at Acts 10. The conversion of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. If we look at the very first verse, uh, he was a centurion uh, in the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Now, 
he's going to say your prayers and gifts have, have come up as a memorial before God in verse 4. And uh, he's to bring back a man named Simon. In the meantime, Simon or Peter is going to have a vision. And that vision is going to make him realize that not only has the Lord died for the Jewish people and for Israel, but he's also died for everybody, even the Gentiles. And Cornelius is a Gentile. Uh, I think it's interesting to notice in the conversion of Cornelius, Cornelius was a good man. He was a good man. His prayers, his memorial, he said his, his prayers had gone up. Uh, they, he and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously. He prayed to God regularly. But there was still the commands that Jesus had given his disciples and they were trying to accomplish them, there were still those commands that Cornelius needed to hear. In other words, he's a good man, but is that enough? Is that enough? Look at what he says in verse 39. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him, hanging him on a cross. God raised him from the dead on the third day. Look at verse 32. He commanded us to preach to the people. They're doing what he was com they were commanded to do and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living God. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, how are they going to receive the forgiveness of sins through his name? Are they going to receive the forgiveness of sins through his name different than how they received it in Acts 2? No. It's going to be the same way. It's going to be the same way. So, when he says to them, who believes in him and receives the forgiveness of sins. How are they going to do that? While they're still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. He ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why did they know why and that they were going to receive that forgiveness of sins? Because they were going to do the very same thing that they had done in Acts 2. They were going to be immersed, uh, which brought them to the point of forgiveness of sins. He comes to faith, he's immersed. So in all of these uh, examples, this is what we have so far. Let's look at Acts 16. We're going to cover all the examples of conversion in Acts. What we find in Acts, uh, Acts 16 here, Paul is meeting with some Jewish women. You remember Lydia? Looking at 16 and verse 11, verse 13 on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down to speak with the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple. She was a worshiper of God. I think it's interesting. She was a worshiper of God. But look what happens here. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Now, the Lord opened her heart. She's a lady of prayer. She's there praying. But the Lord is going to open her heart to do what? to respond to the message that, uh, that's going to, that Paul is going to do here. When she and the member of the household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. So we find from Lydia, here in verse 16, she's going to hear, Paul's going to speak to him, and she's going to respond to Paul's message, and her response is what? to be baptized. Now, you can understand that she also repented. You can understand that she also believed. 
doesn't say she believed. She responded, but you know she believed, don't we? She confessed. And she was baptized uh, for the same reason that this, that Cornelius and um, those in Acts 2 were baptized for the remission of sins. Now let's look at verse uh, 16, Acts 16 and talk about the Philippian jailer just a little bit. Um, if you look about, if you remember Paul and Silas are in prison and in the 25th verse about midnight they're praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners are doing what? They are listening. So the Philippian jailer, he's listening too. He's hearing. There's an earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and the prison doors fall open. Everyone's chains come loose. The jailer wakes up. Well, and he's about to kill himself. Why? Because they're going to kill him. <laughs> when, if you're the jailer and you let people escape, they, the authorities are going to take his life. And he knows that. And Paul says, don't do it. We're all here. The jailer uh, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of God to him and to all the others in his house. So after he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Is that the end of it? Is that where it stopped? Did Paul not teach him anything else? Were they done? No. Mm. Did he preach to him something different than he was teaching uh, Cornelius or something different that he was teaching uh, the Jewish women and Lydia here? Was he teaching him something different than he had taught the Ethiopian eunuch? No, not at all. It's, so, and the reason we know this is because look what it says. They spoke the word of God. He said that to him, and then what did he do? He taught him what he needed to do. He taught him what he needed to do to all the others in his house. And that out, so what, what happens now? Are we done? Do we stop? Have we believed and it's all over? No, look what happens. That hour of the night, the jailer takes them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and his household were baptized. So we see that the Philippian jailer is doing exactly the same thing that all of these other people were doing. I want you to turn now uh, to Acts 18. And in Acts 18, they are, uh, they are in Corinth in verse 5. Uh, Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia. Um, and then verse 7, Paul left for the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So what did they do, the Corinthians? They hear, and they believe. They hear, they believe, and they were baptized. And you see, you can see the pattern emerging here. And they are doing what they were told to do by Jesus. And we're looking and seeing what they're doing. So let's uh, look at, uh, I, I'm not going to cover Acts 19, but you can. Basically, what's happened here is that some of these people had only heard of the baptism of John. And so they were baptized in the, in the same way so that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What did we read in Acts 2? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and what are you going to receive? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts 19, we're seeing these people baptized because they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. But let's go down and look at Acts 22 and look at the Apostle Paul. So in Acts 22... And let's go to verse 6 over here. At noon as I came near Damascus, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And who are you, Lord? So when he said, who are you, Lord, what has he done? 
He's heard, and now he's believing, isn't he? He's heard, he's believing. He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Uh, and then what does he say in verse 16? What shall I do, Lord? Kind of sounds like Acts 2, doesn't it? When they're cut to the heart and they say, what shall we do to be saved? And he says, what should I do? And he's told to go to Damascus. And he goes into Damascus. And in verse 12, he meets a man by the name of Ananias. He's a devout observer of the law and highly respected. Uh, and Saul receives his sight. And then in verse 14, he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and heard. And then his question is this, And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. One of the scriptures we, we hear, it came out of the King James Version, was it where people would say, you know, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Well, how did Paul call on the name of the Lord? By being baptized. So, let's look at what happened with Paul. He hears a voice. Uh, he says, what shall I do, Lord? So we know he's believed at that point. And then he's told to get up, be baptized. And what's the purpose for his baptism? Wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord. Those are all of the examples we have that tell us how the apostles went about doing what they were told to do. All of the examples. And so I'm going to give you just an aside here. In how many of these conversion experiences and acts do we find the instruction, pray, confess, and accept Jesus as your personal Savior? I don't want to be mean, folks. I don't want to be mean. But it's not in there. I'm serious. I don't want to be mean, and I don't want to belittle, and I don't want to make fun, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But you can search all through that book, and you will never find a place where it says to be saved you confess and accept Jesus as your personal savior. It's not in there. A decision to do what the apostles taught is the beginning of discipleship. And so look at this little chart and, you, and this will relate to you what I was trying to explain uh, before we started this little journey. Um, notice that while different elements in each conversion are mentioned one thing that's mentioned in every element of conversion is what? baptism every conversion includes baptism so all of these that we went through hear, repent, baptism, forgiveness hear, believe, baptism uh, here, doesn't even mention believe in the Ethiopian eunuch, confess baptism. Cornelius, you can see what he did. Lydia, what she did. Philippian jailer, what she did. And by putting all these together, basically what I'm trying to tell you is we know what everybody did. It just wasn't mentioned in every case. All right. To me, that's what we need to do when we try to share with the Lord. But there's going to be a lot more questions than that, and I know that. I know that. Have you ever, any of you have a Bible app on your phone? What do you have, Jesus? Bible Gate's really popular. I put this in your, uh, I put this in your packets here. I, I just happened to get this olive tree. Do you have to pay for Bible Gate? Okay, well I, I ended up with olive tree and it's free, you know. <laughs> it's free and I downloaded it uh, here. Uh, olive tree uh, is an app. You can download it uh, in any of these by going to olivetree.com. 
I downloaded the NIV version and what's really neat about it, when there are questions, somebody says, well, how about the other scriptures on baptism? Baptism, search, boom, there they are. <laughs> how about the other scriptures on faith? Boom, there they are. How about the scriptures on uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper? Lord's Supper, boom, there they are. So if you, if you want to talk to someone and you want to get into things that are deeper than where I am now, I think that's a, that's a good way to do it, get an app. And also I want to uh, tell you that uh, Mr. Gordon back there and Mr. Jesus, they also have some good materials that could lead you to uh, a little further study. But uh, this is the start, I think, of sharing God's gift. Now, once we get to that point, True conversion should be just the start of being a disciple. Now, okay, we've, we've, we've heard, we've believed, we've repented, we've confessed, we've been baptized for the remission of our sins. Is it all over? Uh-uh. That's part of what I'm here for. Going to all the world, we're going to, he that believe in this baptized shall be saved, but we're to do what? Make disciples and teach them to obey everything I have commanded. So here it says, the new birth, the new birth, uh, punching the wrong buttons, the new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and into an inheritance that can never perish. We now, because we have obeyed the gospel, we have a living hope. How do we have that living hope? Because of the new birth. What was the new birth? John 3, 3. Except a man born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. How can a man go back into his mother's womb and be reborn? Jesus says, except a man born of the water and the spirit. Born of the water and the spirit. That is a birth. Romans 6 teaches us that. All right. So, uh, we also need to understand that true conversion is the start of discipleship. We were dead in our transgressions. We followed the ways of the world. God had great love for us, but when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. We are saved by grace. Is that a conflict? No. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. That's why we do what he asked us to do. It's pretty simple, really. All right. A disciple lives a changed life for Christ. We don't just, uh, we aren't just baptized for the remission of our sins and then just go on and pretend like nothing has changed. Remember what the question we asked back there? How has that changed us? We were bought with a price. We honor God with our bodies. We're not living for the world anymore. We're not living for pleasure. We're not living for the absence of pleasure. What does that mean? That means even when bad things come to us, we are living for Christ. That's what that means. We're living for Christ. And this is important right here, guys. A disciple wants to be with God's people. We saw in Acts 2, the Lord added to the church. Look what happened. God placed all things under his feet and wanted him to be head of the church. That's Jesus, head of the church. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. It's so important that we realize that the church is part of the plan and Jesus wants to be a part of the church. It's made up of the saved people in Acts 2. Some people say, well, I don't need the church. I can worship God on my own or a mountain or whatever. But no, the church is important. If it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't be its head. He wouldn't have given himself up for it. The church is important. Okay. Now I'm going to get into some of the... Uh, one last thing here and then we're going to take a break. When we talk about talking to other people... One of the ways that Jesus converted people was he found out what their needs were. Shrivel hand. Leprosy, paralytic, a woman at the well. He saw their needs. 
People were listening to Jesus because he reached out to their knees. And research has shown that people are genuinely going to listen to us more if what? If they think we're interested in them. If they think we care about them. So what are felt needs? Their money, their marriage, their work, their loneliness, what they're discouraged about, what they fear. We need to listen to people about those things. I wanted to hug a girl at work so bad one time. Her husband had divorced her and told her she was a bad person. And, you know, Gordon will tell you in the workplace, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> I felt so sorry for her. I just wanted to let her cry on my shoulder. But I listened to her. And that's what Jesus did. And that's what we need to do. I'm going to quickly look at John 9. If you want to turn your Bibles over to John 9. Um, I'm going to do this quickly so we can take a little break before we finish up here in the next session. In John 9, Jesus sees a man born blind. His disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Do you remember this story? If you look down in verse 6, Jesus spits on the ground, makes some mud with saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing. This man had needs, didn't he? How did people respond to his needs? How did they respond? Let's look at here. Well, there was the disciples' view. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? So are they worried about his needs? No, it's a, this is a theological question to them. This is a biblical question. Who are we gonna, how are we gonna reconcile this with our biblical thoughts and then there's another view here the neighbor's view isn't this the same man that used to sit and beg they put a label on him didn't he oh he's an alcoholic he's no good this is the guy you know he's just a beggar over there he doesn't matter that was their viewpoint about his needs then look at this the Pharisee view they ask him how uh, how did you receive your sight? Well, see, this was going to be a problem for their very comfortable religion. This was going to be a problem. Well, wait a minute. Who could do this kind of thing? That was their viewpoint. Now, here's a man with needs, and so far we haven't found anybody that was sympathetic with his needs. They're just worried about themselves, right? Parents' view is, we don't know. He was born blind, but how can we see him now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. It ain't my problem, man. <laughs> Isn't that what they're saying? And that's not my problem. So nobody is concerned about him. But look at this. Here's the Jesus view. Neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That's our view toward people with needs. I don't know why he's an alcoholic, but I'll tell you this, he needs Jesus. Does that make sense? That's the way we share God's gift. And I'm gonna quickly go through these last couple of things. We should smell good in a stinking world. <laughs> I made up that title. I like it. <laughs> I like it. In 1st 2 Corinthians, thanks to God, uh, who always leads us in triumphal procession. And look at the bottom part. We are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. We need, to, we need to smell good. And we smell good by showing each person with a new perspective. No matter how they respond, be the aroma of Christ and meet their needs. We help meet the needs of people, no strings attached. We don't just help people because we think they might obey the gospel. We help them because they're people. And then we're going to let God do the rest. That's what he's saying. And if we do this, guess what? Somebody might listen to us and take us seriously. And that's the way Jesus, I believe, would have done it.
back then. Let's take a break, and I'll try not to go so long on the on the last one, and we'll. Uh,